Good evening, everybody. So, um, a few uh, housekeeping things. Um, if anyone's parked over near where the police need to get out, please go move or else they're going to come in and make you move. So that's, uh, I guess that's the first announcement we need to make is uh, if you're blocking the emergency vehicles, you shouldn't see. Um, so, there's something playing? Yeah. Okay. No, on. Turn off TikTok. <laughs> the time and place for that, not too bad. Um, so, um, we're going to start off by, and I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Toby Jongro. I'm an attorney here in Fort Kent. I've lived in Fort Kent now for 13 years. I, uh, my wife's here, Jennifer. Uh, my two daughters who live here in town with me. My dad lives in St. Francis. I grew up in St. Francis. Um, we're going to start off by kind of discussing what's going on. Um, as you can see, Channel 4 is here, Channel 8 is here, Public Radio is here. Um, I only plan on Channel 4, so same rules follow for everybody else. So the goal here is not to have Channel 4 to live stream. Uh, we've asked Channel 4, they've asked to record, we've said that's fine. We're not doing a live stream on this. This isn't being put up on the internet right now. This isn't being broadcast on Facebook. And the reason for that is because we've had a lot of folks come forward to us and express concerns, and we want them to have an opportunity to be heard. But we also want um, the members of our board, who I see many of them here, and I want to thank you for coming. I see John Ezzi, I see Steve here, thank you. And there's some that I don't recognize, and I apologize. But um, we want the board members to understand that the community is concerned. Um, and we want you to see that it's a community and not just me being a troublemaker. Um, <laughs> So, the rules for participation tonight is um, we're asking everybody to be respectful. We're working with the best information we've been able to discern. Um, we've gotten our information primarily from uh, current and former staff from the hospital. Um, we ask there be no personal attacks. A lot of folks have some very strong opinions about certain people, and we ask you to keep those to yourself because it's not helpful. Um, I think we all agree that we want a hospital, we want a fully functioning hospital, we want the things that we need to survive as a community. So personal attacks don't get us any closer. Broad political statements aren't helpful either. I've never been approached by both the Democrats and the Republicans, but this is a new thing for me. I've been approached by people from both parties, and I, I'm really excited about that. Um, we're asked that there's no disruption. Um, we've got a program, we're going to present what we can. If we have time, we're going to ask for some public information, public feedback. We had a sign-up sheet out front. And it's a bit of a caveat. Um, the goal of this meeting is to let the administration and the board know what people's concerns are. So I want to be clear, the reason that we're having the public feedback session is for if people in the public want to share, they can. And the goal is for, and we're hoping that the administration and the board listens to what the community says. So I want to be clear, we're not being mean here by saying we want to hear from the community. It's that we need to hear from the community. So we're asking the board members and the administration to, to listen tonight and to let the community be heard and that'll act as a solve. That's going to start what we need to do to make the community feel better. So I ask that you respect that. And if you want to speak at some other time, we'd be happy to speak with you. We'd be happy to give you a venue, but we ask that tonight be the community's night. So, we can start. Why are we here? Um, well, as I, state, as I stated briefly, the, the group was formed in part because of people reaching out to me personally and uh, discussing concerns about what's going on in the hospital. I meet with a lot of people in my office and um, I care deeply about the people who come in and they, they often share things that have nothing to do with what uh, they come to see me for. Uh, people come in for a will and they talk to me about other things. So, that, among some other things that Jen's going to talk about, kind of brought the group together. Um, so the, the goal was to, the group coalesced around people wanting to share information. 
in part because there were a lot of rumors going around town. And um, it's one thing the administration has said is they're very concerned about, about rumor mongering, and, and so are we, which is why we started collecting actual data and trying to talk to people who actually knew. Um, so that's what started this group. And then we decided to come together tonight so we could start a conversation about some of the proposed changes and some of the changes that have happened already at the hospital. Um, and for people to share their concerns. And we're hoping to provide a forum to allow the community, to give the community a place to be courageous. It's very scary to stand up and talk. I do it all day, it doesn't scare me, but most people are afraid to talk. And I want to make sure that the people in the community can speak up and can say what's important to them, what their concerns are, and share them in a place where they're going to be heard, validated, and where the people who are making the decisions at the hospital can hear them. So part of what really got us moving is we noticed a few things. Um, we weren't getting a lot of communication from official channels. We were hearing a lot of information from the grapevine. In fact, that's how we found out our daughter's PCP had left the uh, had left Northern Maine Med. Um, the second thing that kind of raised some red flags for us is what is being communicated doesn't always match what we're hearing from trusted sources. There's a discrepancy there, and for us, that was a concern. And the third red flag for us was the values seem to have changed. This was started as a people's benevolent hospital. It wasn't necessarily started as a business enterprise. It was there to serve the people of the community. It seems like the values have shifted a little bit, and we'd like to talk about that today. So what has changed over the last few years? Uh, well, there's been a pandemic. We can only blame so much on that, though. So what else has changed? We've hired a new CEO um, back in February 2022. So um, I Googled him just to see if I could find out any more about him to help inform us on <coughs> what perhaps is happening and where we're headed. What I found was Bradford Regional Medical Center. Bradford Regional Medical Center is in Bradford, Pennsylvania. It's um, a smallish town on the border with New York. A lot of, um, and there are a lot of similarities with our region, including they have some pretty bad winters due to the lake effect snow. They have a population of a little less than 8,000. They're a service center for 2.5 counties. Of course, their counties are much smaller than our county. Um, they're located near the Allegheny State Park and the Allegheny National Forest. So logging is a big part of their, uh, their economic picture, as is tourism. Um, they have a branch of the University of Pittsburgh there in Bradford. They have a, an enrollment about 1,100. They have a nursing program and a master's of nursing program there that used to work very closely with Bradford Regional Medical Center. And every town should have their own little factoid and claim to fame. They're the home of Zippo. So um, I started just by looking up articles. These are all really easy to find online. Feel free to go look for yourself. We're also going to post them on the Save, um, Save Northern Maine Med website. So this is the first story I found. It goes into the challenges the residents of the area are experiencing now that they no longer have a full service hospital. And um, it starts off with a family who's having to travel so much further while their child is in, while they're, while the, um, there's a grandmother traveling with her daughter about how far a grandmother traveling with her, with her daughter much further than she normally would have had to have gone while she was in labor. It's um, death by a thousand cuts. Rural Pennsylvania residents lament more cuts to local hospitals during the pandemic. This is from their local public radio station. Uh, the next one is published by the Bradford Era. Hospital officials address rumors regarding Bradford Regional Medical Center. This one addresses the administration's attempt to address the rumors circulating in the community about the status of the hospital, whether or not it's about to close. All of these articles can once again be easily found online. Um, this next one is the Olean from the Olean Times Herald. Little word from Upper <coughs> Allegheny after CEO resigns. Just I'll read it because I'm guessing most of you can't see this. Um, just a few, uh, this is just the first couple of paragraphs. Uh, just a few months after announcing the merger of services between Bradford and Olean, they're not French, they call it Olean, New York Hospital's President and CEO Jeff Zui re resigned and left the healthcare system. 
Upper Allegheny Health Systems has said little regarding Zuby's departure when contacted with questions regarding the development. Spokesman Dennis McCarthy said only that Jeff resigned and left the organization. The organization will not comment on further reasons. Then I found this. This is the one that really made us curious. Grassroots effort launches to save Bradford Hospital. Some things are too important to lose. That's the message from a group of local women who started a Facebook group called Save Bradford Hospital. It was started by Betsy Costello of Bradford, Marty Wilder of Marshburg, and Harriet Neville of Eldridge, just a sampling of the communities impacted by the consul consolidation of services in the Upper Allegheny Health System. Our goal is to investigate the loss of our hospital, Costello told the era. I think everyone's curious about information that wasn't shared with us. A statement from the group indicated it was started out of frustration. Our hospital is closing without so much as a fight. This isn't the Bradford we know. We are fighters. I should have said something sooner. <laughs> uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is the one that really made us curious. This group, Save Bradford Hospital, has a website and a Facebook page. They're both really easy to find. This is a picture from one of them. I'll read you the mission statement. Our mission is to support and promote the creation of an economically viable, easily accessible, full-service healthcare facility or facilities for everyone in the Bradford area. So we reached out to these folks and had a really nice meeting a couple of weeks ago. They had lots to say, but rather than me recounting the conversation, whoops, one of these days, um, I'd like to introduce you to Marty Wilder. She's going to tell us what happened in her own words. Um, Marty is a 40-year veteran of the news industry. She most recently was the editor of the Bradford Era. And um, she has been so, ins well, maybe frustrated by what's going on in her community that she's running for county commissioner. No, I'm not on. Where's Toby? Hi, can you help? I don't know why this isn't working. We gotta zoom the bottom. It's not registering anything. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Marty had to step away for a minute. She'll be back in a second. <laughs> We're really well organized today. So we're waiting for Marty. I'm just going to talk a little bit about Bradford. We were able to meet with them, and they were um, they were a group of people that looked a lot like us, sounded a lot like us, and had a lot of the same concerns as we do. Um, we shared what they shared with us, what had happened in their hospital, and. To date, what happened in their hospital has happened. Some of it's happened to ours, and that's that's what's frightening. Is we've hit the point where, and Marty's hopefully going to come on. If she doesn't, I know. Um, the first step was a departure of a number of their PCPs. Primary care was diminished significantly. Um, many of the services that they had uh, had before diminished some. Uh, access to some of the basic Sorry, stuff was less than uh, less than what they had hoped. So we're presenting Bradford, hoping that it's not a prediction of what happens here, but fearing that it might be. So we're presenting it today. It hasn't happened yet, but we don't want to be Bradford. We don't want to be Bradford, and we're hoping that by talking about what happened in Bradford, we can avoid what happened in Bradford. Is Marty coming on? Mm-hmm. Let me know when you're ready. I know. I swear to God, this worked before. We tried this <laughs> twice already today, and it worked just fine. Toby, yeah. Toby, aren't we talking about the same CEO? It, it is, it is, yes. It's, uh, it's the same CEO, and um, I, I suspect it's a, it's a, we're seeing a lot of closures nationwide. And uh, I don't, like I said, I, I don't want to make it personal. That was the thread that led us there. But I think it's a management style. Okay. And that's what we're worried about, is it's a management style. Entirely close um, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be clear that we just want to make sure that we don't go do the same thing. You don't see the video. Let's turn her around and have her talk. Into the mic. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, I'm going to take it from the top. 
Um, my name is Marty Wilder. I'm calling from Bradford, Pennsylvania, and um, Bradford is right on the New York State border. And that's an important factor as I tell my little story. Um, I was shopping years ago now in the biggest supermarket market in town, and a woman who I knew as a nurse at our local hospital came up to me and said, did you hear what's going on at the hospital? It's really a travesty. You have to do something about it. Well, first of all, I had no idea what was going on, and I didn't know why I had to do something about it. But I started looking into the situation at the hospital, and the woman was right. It was a travesty. Now, we lost our um, maternity care several years ago, before this, before this conversation. So we're a little bit ahead of you in the story. But in about March of 2021, um, the, the um, group, the healthcare group that owned uh, our hospital, with very little announcement in the local paper or to local people, decided they were going to close the hospital. They saved outpatient care, but they, they closed all the beds and they eliminated everything that basically was an emergency. We had no operating room and we uh, had no intensive care unit. And their plan was to eliminate all the beds, but the state of Pennsylvania, excuse my voice, State of Pennsylvania required that they have at least 10 beds. So they did have 10 beds, and it went up to 20 beds during the COVID outbreak. Um, so that's what we were left with. And when this all happened, it was kind of known in town, you know what you're going through right now, you really don't understand what's going on, and you're not getting a clear picture from the hospital or the spokesman. When you call, like, we made contact with our state representative, our city council, and other groups in town, and everybody said the same thing, basically, that there's nothing we can do. They announced that they're gonna close it, and this is how it's gonna be. If you don't like it, um, well, too bad, because then we'll close down the whole hospital. So nobody in this town, and it's about, probably an area about 15,000 people, at any plant, and me and a couple friends, um, we just decided that that was ridiculous. If nobody was going to stand up and fight, then we would stand up and fight for our hospital. You know, it's named Bradford Hospital for a reason. The people in Bradford built the hospital. They've given literally millions of dollars to it in recent years even, and we felt ownership of the hospital. And for them to take it away with very, you know, hardly any explanation at all, we just found it was full. So anyway, we started a group, and um, we got interviewed in a local newspaper. They did a big story on us. And the first thing we did, we started a Facebook group. Um, and within days, we had over 2,000 people, which is a lot for our small area. And everybody was concerned for the same reasons as we were. You know, nobody nobody was protesting the closure of this hospital. So anyway, you know, we had a, a group together and we had a couple of town hall meetings and we have made progress. One of the things that we've made progress in is there was a leadership team at the hospital that had pulled deal. And the one guy retired and the person that took his place was a, a Mr. Zewi, um, who you people are probably familiar with. And there was another person um, that was also in the, in the leadership team. And it, within a short period of time, they had all departed for one reason or another. And we were left with a woman who had worked for the main company for a few years. Um, the main company was um, called Kaleida. It's a Buffalo healthcare system. And they are the ones who owned us, still own us. And the overall plan was basically cut down virtually all of the services in our hospital and to direct people across the state line to a hospital only in New York, General Hospital, 
which has a one-star rating from Medicare. <clears throat> and we were supposed to send the patients there. Now it's about 25 miles away. Um, we live in an area that probably, similar to yours, we have terrible winters. A hundred inches of snow a year is not going to cross. We have terrible roads, like all people do in rural areas. And they wanted us to send people that were really sick across the line. Now, they didn't make any plans, really, for transportation for people. Um, they didn't iron out any insurance issues. They didn't make sure there were enough ambulances. And they apparently didn't hire enough people at this hospital because we would send people over there at Plymouth. And occasionally, they would send them back to us. They did not have enough staff to accept our people. And we, um, we have existed in the meantime. Um, they've hired a new administrator who is a local woman, and people seem to have faith that she is going to be able to bring back our services. I don't have any faith whatsoever that, that she'll be able to do it. Because the whole thing that we're dealing about here, they've been crystal clear that this is not about health care. This is about whether or not fiscally independent. And as we all know, rural hospitals were in a vulnerable position. Long before COVID, we were in a vulnerable position, but we managed to um, survive. So their tactic basically was they got together with groups of people um, in the community and said that basically, um, you know, this is what we're doing. If you don't uh, want, if you don't, if you don't like it, well, it's really too bad because we're doing it anyway. And if you resist, then then we'll close down the hospital once and for all, and you won't even have a hospital. Now we are in the middle north central part of Pennsylvania. It's extremely rural. I know people always think Pennsylvania is like really urban. Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, yes. The rest of uh, uh, the state is it's one of the remotest part of that. And so we're rural, and uh, we don't have um, a lot of amenities. And of course, you can never attract any doctors here. We're told that over and over again. Um, but we have the nearest hospital that we have is smaller than we are. That's about 35 miles away. There's one and only in New York that I mentioned that's about 25 miles. There's one in Powdersport, Pennsylvania, which is probably about a 50 minute drive. And beyond, then there's hospitals beyond that that are smaller. It's a bunch of small towns up here. The nearest city to us is Buffalo. And um, this Kaleida that I mentioned, Kaleida Health, they are located in Buffalo, New York, it's in, uh, in the Buffalo area. And they have a, a few rural hospitals as well. So anyway, um, we are still in the battle. Um, I think our, we had our industries and our um, wealthier people with us at the beginning, but when they hired this new woman to be the administrator, they sort of dropped off. Now it's been almost a year since she's been there, and we're just now starting to hear that people um, don't expect any resolution from Kalida or from Olean, and it's just kind of sitting there. Um, doing nothing and uh, being really inefficient. And the hospital in Olean, I don't even want to tell you the things that we've heard. It's, it's really, it's, it's not a good place for cleanliness or healthcare. And if we could write stories of every person that has been through there, you know, people wouldn't, wouldn't believe it probably. We've also had problems at our hospital, but they've been more recent. Until this happened, we had a really good hospital. You guys probably do too. Everything was going along fine. You know, we had no inkling that there was any trouble. Until they, they closed the maternity wards. And people were upset about it, but not at all prepared for what was going to come. And it was a gap of a couple years from the maternity ward to when they actually started. They, they took away the operating room and the ICU. And they literally took instruments off the wall, beds, chairs, uh, computer screens. They literally took that stuff 
out of our ICU and out of our operating room and moved it to OEM. That's kind of where we stand right now. Um, I would like to tell you that everything went away and everything's fine now. It's not. We're still in this mess and there's more and more rural hospitals that are, you know, they justify what's going on by saying, well, you know, all rural hospitals have this problem. You know, well, really, since when? You know, since they wanted to make it a problem. I'm sorry, but what we've learned in two years and we've done an incredible amount of research is that the bottom line is the bottom line and they're concerned about making money and so the people be damned i hate to say it that way but we know for a fact of different people who have, who have died either in transit to the other hospital in the other hospital some people were sick and went to the hospital were not treated properly went to another hospital and died from the service they got in Bradford. So, I mean, we could go on and on. But, you know, <clears throat> I just want you to understand, I don't know what's going to happen now. But <clears throat> if you read the papers, you can see that this kind of thing is starting to happen all over the country. They're using the same arguments, and um, <clears throat> they're going to tell you there's nothing you can do. And, you know, we understand that, and we might end up that there is nothing we can do. But, you know, we're going to be damned if we're going to go down without a fight. Right now, I'm running for county commissioner. I just secured the Democratic nomination. Mm -hmm. And the main reason I'm doing it, I didn't want to, I'm retired, was to see if maybe if I have a seat at the table, I can figure something out with these governments and uh, the, pol the politicians and uh, the people that are the movers and shakers in town. So, you know, that's my presentation. I just wanted to, you know, share with you what we've been through. There's, we have been in touch with another group, Riverton, Wyoming. They were, they were written about in the uh, Wall Street Journal. <clears throat> and they had stood up against their hospital closure like we, would, like we were starting to do. And I, when I read the story, Thank you. I called it. just a few months ago on a new hospital. They got a $26 million loan from the USDA. So we looked at them as like, our, you know, they give us confidence. We can do this. Thank you, Marty. You're welcome. If anybody has questions, let me know. So if you wanted to reach out to the city, Bradford Regional Medical uh, Group, they, uh, they're they pretty responsive with their email. It's a great way to get in touch with them to find out more. Um, Does that help? Yeah. Uh, I don't know what's going on with this. So, you're back on. Okay. Um, so the reason the reason we wanted you to hear from Marty, this isn't about Jeff Zui. This is about the model that was used to make changes, drastic, sudden changes that were not um, communicated to the community. And they lost their primary care, they lost their OB unit. It, it kind of sounds a little like what's happening here. So, um, really, this all worked this morning. Um, it's, but we wanted you, we wanted you to just know this is this is a model that's being brought to Fort Kent. This seems to be the model that's being brought to the decision making process. We're hearing from them that the model didn't really work during the process, and the hospital now really isn't working for them now. That's their past. I don't know if it's our present, presence, and I a present, and I hope it's not our future. But I'm worried. I'm really worried. And now I'm going to mess with my computer to see if I can get it going again. You have to close the screen and open it back up again. We can see you, but it can't. Your screen's not on. Um, okay, so I'm going to proceed as if there was a PowerPoint up. Um, so the next thing um, we want to talk about was a number of people came to us to discuss the, the number of providers who were gone. We haven't really gotten a clear picture of the number, so we've been able to talk to current and former hospital staff. 
And right now we can confirm um, 15 providers that are gone or leaving. Uh, seven PCPs, two surgeons, two ER doctors, two psychiatric nurse practitioners, one interim CMO, it's a doctor, and one nurse anesthetist. You're not sitting around. You don't know. But you don't sit around. We've heard from um, other news sources that there are likely more, uh, but we've not been able to confirm beyond the set of 15 that we know are, are gone or leaving. Um, why did people leave? Well, the official report has been that the people left because they were they resigned. And I talked to a board member, and I called a board member, and I was told that they left because um, nobody wants to live here. It's too far away from everything. And I, that's what I said to him. But we're friendly, so I was nice about it. Um, and so that, that piqued our interest. So we started asking former people who would work there. None of them wanted to come and speak on the record. Um, but we were able to discern that there were four, four paths out. Um, some folks had their contracts changed after they were signed. Uh, we've had one doctor tell us that much, that there was a contract that was changed after it was signed. Uh, so they left. We've had a few providers leave because they, the terms of the contracts for the renewal were reneg renegotiated in such a way that cut their, their pay and benefits. We've heard that some providers were threatened that if they didn't resign, there would be complaints made against them to some sort of medical board. Um, so they resigned. And then some were just terminated with an option to resign. And we have the termination letters. So the story has been, nobody's been terminated, we have termination letters. That's disconcerting because what we're hearing is they all left us in the life of town. Um, in a press conference on uh, May 17th, there was a, uh, the press asked for confirmation. They were able to get confirmation on 11th uh, in the press conference before the administration stopped answering questions. They went through, the, they, initially the response was, well, we, uh, we're not, we're not, we haven't lost anybody, we're not losing people. And then the reporter asked one at a time, did so-and-so leave? Yes. Did so-and-so leave? Yes. So-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. And they got to 11, and then the answer was, we're not answering any more questions. <laughs> so we know we're missing 11. We're fairly certain we're missing 15, and I think the uh, main monitor's thinking is closer to 20-something. Um, another thing that's happened in part of this that's really been distressing around the providers leaving is the lack of notice. Uh, as Jen said, we, our kids have gone to the same doctor since they were babies. We didn't realize we lost our doctors until we heard from somebody we knew. And we called and tried to make an appointment, and they said, oh, we don't have that doctor anymore. Um, it was really unsettling. I mean, we've got a daughter with a very significant medical condition, and can, continuity of care is one of those things that hospitals should care about. And if our doctor doesn't know who we are, we don't know who our doctor is, we're in trouble. <laughs> Um, and she got transferred to a doctor on the coast somewhere. It's the weirdest thing. Anyway, um, so when I asked another board member about what the why we we're losing all these doctors, the part of the response was they don't want to live here. Part of it was we need to right size. We need to bring our size down. We need to put more money into orthopedic surgery. And one of the questions I asked, and I didn't get an answer, is if there's no primary care, who is going to make the referrals for orthopedic surgery? Um, that doesn't seem like a panacea, because everybody's leaving. We've had to leave the hospital, other people have had to leave the hospital. I don't know who's gonna make the referrals. Um, we have OB providers, um, and nurses that were skilled with working with um, working with children, and many of them are gone. And as I understand it, it's become increasingly difficult to um, to do certain there's certain training, um, some sort of life support training for pediatrics. And my understanding is that a number of the people who used to do that are no longer there. So it's increased difficulty in trying to provide intensive care, or I don't know what the word is, but intensive care, I guess we'll call it, um, services for, for children right now. Um, 
We've also had some other notable departures, and I'll just read them. We've lost our director of nursing. We've lost our director of medical practices, our lab supervisor, radiology supervisor, patient financial services manager, assistant director of human resources, director of human resources, and project manager for the nursing home. They're all gone. Uh, we've heard from reliable sources that some of these folks were pushed out as well, some were walked out. Um, I understand, I mean, I've run a business. By losing this accumulative, the accumulative loss of the years of experience and institutional knowledge that went with that, it's got to be devastating. I can't imagine losing my staff, having had them for 15 years, 13 years, and having them walk out and having to train your staff. So that's that's disconcerting. It's really worrisome because we don't know some of the people who replaced them. Um, there have been a number of outsourced departments: anesthesiology, nurse manager, psychiatry, radiology has been partially outsourced. Billing and patient financials, as many of you have talked about on Facebook, has been have been outsourced. And orthopedic, orthopedic surgeons have been outsourced as well. So well, there's an announcement that there's additional orthopedic surgery. They don't live in our community. Okay, they are brought in, they're flown in. <coughs> and we're also hearing about just understaffed departments. Um, we're hearing that people are having to wait for the lab longer than normal. We're hearing certain ultrasound procedures are just not, they're just not able to do them anymore. And um, that primary care is, is currently understaffed, which another personal story is my daughter thought he had, she had strep throat, because her friend had strep throat. In the past, we could pick up the phone, go see our PCP, and they would do a swab. It's a three minute procedure. We were told to go to urgent care in Prescott. That's the solution that's being proffered because it doesn't cost them money for me to go to Prescott. Um, and that's a concern. So we have a number of people coming to us. We're getting our information from sources inside and who have recently left the hospital. Uh, we're working with the best information we have, but I mean, it's, it's all coming from people who are there. So with that said, um, there's also been some discussion. Do you know if, uh, is uh, Mr. Jardin here? I don't know. So we've heard from other people at the, uh, the hospital that um, there's been some talk of people who were, um, that there wasn't, they weren't able to fill certain positions. We've spoken to members of, of the OB department and we've heard that, um, in fact, uh, there were advertisements that went on, people did apply. And that they were uh, not brought in. That there were opportunities for people to come into the hospital and they were deemed not appropriate by the administration. The nursing staff were asking for additional help and they were told that those people were not appropriate for the job. Well, so, you mean that was not appropriate? I, I don't know, I can't speak to that, but I know that they had people who, were, who had applied who were not brought in. So that's a concern. I don't know if it aligns with the statement that was made by the hospital, the press, press conference about putting stuff out there and about advertising I mean, nobody applied, but we know in the past people have applied and they haven't hired them. So we have, um, I think Lee was going to speak briefly about uh, his experience with the uh, cardiology. Yeah, so first I just want to start with a quote from the Bangor Daily News when they covered the press conference uh, May 17th. And paragraph, from, or the, the sentence from uh, the Bangor Daily says, other changes include a new radiology group that provides an in-house radiologist two days a week and they're hiring two new orthopedic surgeons and an oncologist. The hospital is also recruited for a full-time cardiologist. Now, as someone who needs a cardiologist, I applaud that. But I've been waiting four months for an echocardiogram. So what good does it make to bring in a cardiologist if we can't have an echocardiogram, then an echocardiogram than at our hospital? And I, like Toby, also talked to a lot of people in my office, and I know I'm not the only one who's waiting for that test. So, Bringing cardiologists in sounds great, but it's like building the roof before you build the foundation. So that was my experience that, that I've had, and I know others, I've talked to a lot of people uh, as well have had similar experiences. And I think this goes to rapid contraction, as you can see. Thank you. Thank you. As you can see, uh, there's been a rapid contraction, and, and I understand that the what's being said is that we can't find people to replace people that are missing. 
But um, as you can see from this, um, our numbers are way out of whack for rural hospitals. Callis, uh, Machias, has anybody been to Callis or Machias? Yeah. It's, it's right here, Portland, right? No. <laughs> um, it's just as far away as every, from everything as we are. Um, and they're doing better for open positions right now than we are. And this is reported as of 5-16-23. Uh -huh. uh, and this is from so public sources. Yeah, so we went online and we just looked at what was being what was being advertised. What's out there? And this was on these hospitals' websites. So this information was from Machias Hospital, from Millinocus Hospital, from Holton. That's directly from them. So the 81 from Northern Maine Med, I don't know if you guys can see that or not. Northern Maine Med, they had 81 jobs posted. Carey, 40. Machias, 50. Millinocket, 29. Holton, 30. Callis, 33. Penobscot Valley, that's in Lincoln. 26. So the numbers may have changed since last week, but we're still way ahead. I don't know that that's a good thing. So we are just concerned that these aren't be that aren't these aren't filled not because that we have a lack of people to apply for them, but perhaps they're being not filled just because it's a way to contract the budget. And we want to make sure that's not the case. Okay, that's our concern. We we want to have a hospital, we want a fully functioning hospital. So um, Okay, so how do we get here? Flying off the cuff here. Um, this is from a main monitor article that was published back on the 17th. There was a press conference that day held by the hospital. I'm going to read it to you because I don't know if everyone in the back can read it. We have got some very significant financial challenges that have been happening. He recalled that outside monitors and hospital financial officials projected a serious financial situation last year. One initial projection said the hospital would run a 10.2 million loss in 2023. Are they done out there? Um, and that would grow to 13 million by 2025. Quote, they told us in the hospital board that if you keep doing what you've done over the last years, the hospital will close by Christmas of 2023, Zoe said Wednesday. We're not gonna let this place close, this hospital is not going to close. Wa um, noted that the budget in earlier years was also bleak, but the deficit was largely covered up by state and federal COVID money. That stream of money has ended. Okay, so we don't have current numbers for what's going on here. We don't have a way of getting it right now. We would love to get the numbers if they're available. We just have to use what we do have that is publicly available. This is put out by the Maine Hospital Data Organization. It's part of the Maine State Government. This stuff is publicly available. They have your website. Go check it out. Um, so this is information the hospitals report to the state. This is financial information. We are grouped, NMFC is grouped with other hospitals that have similar number of beds. We're about 40, 45-ish. So in this group with us, there's Cary Medical Center. They're the yellow line. Franklin Medical Center in uh, Farmington. They're the blue line. Inland Hospital, they're in Waterville, the red line. Maine Coast Hospital, that's Ellsworth. They're the orangey yellow line. And Northern Maine Med, they're the green line. This white line here, that's zero. Everything above it is a positive percentage operating margin. Everything below it is negative. So most of the hospitals kind of bounced around some. I think that's normal from what I understand. We're the only hospital that was in the black, oh, well, uh, um, we're the only hospital with a positive operating margin for these past five years. That's 2017 to 2021. Once again, hospital finances can turn on a dime. Just because we've been doing well doesn't mean we always will do well. But it was interesting looking at past data. Um, this is the day's cash on hand. Also for the same time period, same hospitals. Northern Maine Med is once again green. This side is positive. That side is negative. So there are hospitals that were pretty much operating with negative cash on hand for years. We weren't. Our lowest was, I think, 99.6. Once again, hospital finances can change on a dime and we don't have current data. So I can't promise that just because we were doing okay in the past, we're doing okay now. We're just kind of trying to figure out how do we get from there to here. And this is the last bit, the net operating, um, net operating income. Red is, red is red, right? Red is negative, black is, um, black is, black is black. So you'll notice there's only one hospital here that was in the black for the last five years. 
That was Northern Bay Match. So, we talked to folks, um, we talked to former board members, we talked to folks at the statewide level in the insurance industry. Everyone was really surprised to hear that all of a sudden things were really bad at our hospital. Um, I think we were too. Okay. I have a statement I want to read. Uh -oh. No, that's okay. You guys don't need it now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we have heard that an outside analysis was commissioned by the former, by the current administration, but that information has not been shared with the public or the media. We would like a, like a copy of that report to review. If there truly is such a profound financial crisis, that the only possible answer from the original mission, the only possible answer is to transform our hospital away from the original mission of the People's Benevolent Hospital and into Bradford Regional Medical Center Part Two then the people of the St. John Valley who helped build the hospital in the first place deserve to see that data. We deserve hard numbers and open analysis into how we got here, into why we needed to make such extreme cuts so quickly, and why the public was not made aware of these things before it was a crisis. We need information. We're not saying that maybe this isn't the way to go. We're saying we need to know more, please. the request of the board or do you want to do your thing first? Okay. Hi folks, it's uh, really nice to see you all here. My name is Dave Susi. I'm a resident of Fort Kent, uh, lawyer for many years here, fact finder for the state for many years here, retired now. Uh, it's really heartening to see so many people uh, come out tonight. Uh, share our concern about this. I prepared a script. I much prefer to pace back and forth and hold forth at great length. But I'm not going to, I'm going to stick to the script and you can thank me later. You're mocking <laughs> I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about the way the discussion about the hospital crisis has been framed, our frame of reference. The hospital administration has framed the issue as simply an economic one bottom line problem. And the appropriate response to it, we are told, is to simply accept that times change. Economic circumstances change. There are forces out there that force us to change and we must adapt. Like it or not, we must face the hard truth. There is no alternative. <laughs> when you say there is no alternative, you're saying the current situation is hopeless and there's nothing that can be done to make it right. But is that really true? How hard have people tried in this case to save OB services? We've been told in the case of OB it's not about the money. It's about not being able to find OB nurses. <coughs> really? <laughs> We've got a group of doctors who are ready, willing, able and enthusiastic about delivering the service. But the whole thing falls apart because we can't find the necessary nurses to work with that staff. How hard has the hospital really tried to fill those positions? If the future of the hospital hinged upon finding those OB nurses, do you think we could find those nurses somehow? Of course we could. Arguably, the future of the hospital depends on exactly that. Saying there is no alternative is a very effective way to stifle creativity, to stifle imagination, to stifle the kind of committed community action that can address these kinds of crises. It turns us all into a kind of zombie. We just lurk forward into a dystopian future over which we have no control. Let's think for a minute about how this hospital came into being in the 1950s. The effort to create a hospital here was uh, not initiated, wasn't started by business concerns. The community 
needed basic care, including perhaps the most important thing, OB. But it also needed all kinds of basic primary care. Our grandparents understood this, and they understood that if this town was to grow, if it was to have a bright future, it needed to provide these services. Now, people came together back then, the whole community did, to plan out a course of action to build a hospital in Fort Kent. It took many years of fundraising in the community. It was a big effort, but it was recognized as a critical effort uh, for the whole community. Now, the hospital was not built by CEOs. It was built by a religious order of women, the Little Franciscans. It wasn't the bank that put up the money to finance the project. The Little Franciscans did, out of their mother house in Quebec, hundreds of thousands of dollars. It wasn't a business proposition for them, nor was it for us. That's not to say the nuns didn't mind the bottom line. We've all heard the story about the staff there, you know, using the adding machine tape and then turning it around and using the other thing and then reversing it and using it again. <laughs> Very frugal. They kept an eye on the bottom line. The people who founded the hospital called it People's Benevolent Hospital. What a great name. People's Benevolent Hospital. Notice, first of all, that they proclaimed that this was a hospital that belongs to the people. It was founded to serve the needs of the community, first and foremost. To me, this means primary care, and it means OB, basic stuff. Psychiatry, orthopedics, more advanced care is all great if we can get it, but not at the expense of the basics. Second is people's benevolent hospital. It's a benevolent institution. That's a great word from out of the past. It reflects a culture of caring. In fact, benevolent means caring. In response to this, the new administration tells us that we must change our culture. And in fact, that's just what they've told us. We need to change our culture. We must conform our thinking to act like a business. It's true, the hospital must mind bottom line. But our hospital has always minded the bottom line. It's been in black, as you've seen from Jen's presentation, against all national and state trends for years until the new administration arrived. More importantly, though, as the religious order of women who founded the hospital understood, caring for sick people is not first and foremost about making money, or not, not to be anything. It's about taking care of each other. When the hospital was built in the 50s, it probably didn't make much business sense then. But as you all know, we have a can-do attitude, a can-do culture in this community. Some say it's the little town that could. I always hated that framing. But my wife was saying this afternoon, wouldn't it be sad if this was the little town that could and didn't? The community rallied to support the hospital's founding because the community understood that this was what is at the heart of a community. It's what community is all about. We don't need to change our culture. We need to replace it. So what can we do? Toby, you have a list of things that we can do? <coughs> the board, uh, the, the group of, uh, this group of folks have come together and put together a, a list of proposals of uh, things we're asking of the board at the hospital. Um, as I said, we came in here hoping to have it to, to open discussion. We're not having discussion tonight. We're talking to the community, but we want a discussion. So these are the requests of the board. Dave, I'll let you take it from here. Well, you can read it. Um, not all of them can. It's far away. I can't see it. Well, first of all, uh, who here, and hopefully many of you, would like to talk directly with the board of the Northern Maine Medical Center? to learn more about what's going up, going on, and to express our concerns, and to hear from them as well. We think it's important to pause the changes now underway. We think it's very important to plan to return to providing OB services and primary care providers. 
we uh, believe we should keep the equipment that we've accumulated at the hospital and not get rid of it so we don't foreclose our option. We'd like to see the board meetings more public with an opportunity for the public to ask questions and get answers. And of course, we need increased transparency. We want to share the financial reports that are alleged to be behind these changes. So those are some of the things that we think would be appropriate. You may have other ideas as well. We might be able to add to that list. That might be useful. Um, I think we must resolve in any case to act as a community and individually. It may seem that we, uh, the community, have no direct control over the hospital. And in fact, we don't. The hospital is run by a board of trustees. It's not an elected body. We don't even have a place at the table except through them. So what can we do? And remember that the trustees of the organization, we should remember, don't want to lose the hospital either. They are not the enemy. They are our neighbors and our friends. And we can safely assume, I think, that they will act in good faith. And if they don't act in good faith, well, we're all wasting our time. I'm sure that's not the case. We're asking them to reconsider the path the hospital is on. We have every right as the people here to ask that. And that is, after all, um, what people's benevolent hospital is all about. But we've all got to stand up and make ourselves heard. We must overcome the perfectly natural instinct to duck and hide and to avoid a difficult problem and to avoid confrontation. We need to start talking to each other about this. And we must do so with a firm intent to do what's necessary to save basic services at Northern Maine Medical Center. Thank you. As we said earlier, as I said earlier, um, we, we had a sign up list for people who want to speak. Um, there are a number of people who signed up. Um, they weren't sure if they were going to or if they wanted to. I'm going to go through them and I'm going to remind folks that we, it's a community meeting where people are sharing their concerns. I, I'd really like to keep it positive if you're concerned and, and tell, let you know. We presented all the evidence we have. We've gathered this ourselves. Uh, I feel like I've been picking potatoes for Herman Martin. I've been taking little bits of stuff out of the dirt and making the best of it. But, um, so, I'd ask you not to expect us to answer questions right now because we told you everything we know. Um, if you want to share, we're happy to hear you share. Uh, we're going to keep our focus on folks from the community. Uh, we are looking forward to hearing from the board members, but we'd like that to be in a meeting with the board members. So, I've got Jack Norris. Do you still want to speak, Jack? Not yet. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, we've got Janine Welsh here. If you wish to speak, Janine, go ahead. Do we need a mic? Yeah, let's get a mic. Edward's on. It's on. It's on. It goes the stands. Uh, About six years ago, we found a little town of Fort Kent in the green of moving here for four years before we moved here. Uh, by the law of this town. Is it possible? Uh, you guys are so lucky. Uh, it's, it's not, you know, my, my, my first home, but my neighbors have <laughs> family. We, we are so close, and I can't stand that, that we have to leave, and I feel like it's the, the hundreds of year old history of the Acadians literally digging their way into the earth we built fence <laughs> to and then being shouted after trying so hard to make us here and build a homestead. Um, and with the closure of, of OB, we are, we are being pushed out and, and we're leaving. Um, but I'm still here tonight. I'm sticking my neck out. My husband did not say I could speak. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry about the repercussions, but I hope you all know that I'm risking repercussions to let you know that you're so lucky. And together, together, just being a voice, you can bring back the soul to this community. We, we have an obligation to ourselves and our neighbors to just say, hey, you know what? What's going on? Just let us know. If we're in a deficit, let's fix it. Because 
there are people from outside this community that dream about living in the community as beautiful as all of your people and how you stick your neck out for each other. Oh. And you know, if people don't speak, that's why. It's because they're all they all don't want to hurt their neighbors, their friends, and their family. And I don't have a whole lot of booze when nobody really knows me. So I'm just gonna go ahead and, and say that. But, um, that's uh, I think my husband has really enjoyed taking care of this community and, and building the community and such a plethora of the services that he provides and I know that there are other physicians that provide a plethora of services that want to live the dream of living in the valley. Because come on, people come to vacation here. <laughs> All right, before I cry, I'll leave there. Thank you. Rick Douglas. Uh, unfortunately, the people I wanted to talk to tonight are not here. But I did a little research, and you know, one of the excuses that were given about closing the obstetrics unit is that they couldn't find anybody to come and work here. There were no nursing staff to do that. Well, I did some research and I discovered that there are more than 2,600 colleges and universities in the United States with nursing programs. And I find it hard to believe that someone at the hospital didn't bother to reach out to 10%, 50%, or hire somebody to spend a few weeks contacting every single one of those institutions to find someone who would be willing to come to Fort Kent for five years or six years, or maybe establish a program where we subsidize their tuition and in return, they promise to come and work here for a while. It's done with, with doctors in rural areas. Why can't it be done with nurses? That's all I have to say. <laughs> and Carol and Judy, are you gonna talk at the same time? No, let it go. <laughs> if you were all the concerned group, but there was no one going on now. To me, to fix that, you gotta start from the top. Work your way down. There's something wrong with the top. So, you know, it's like a business. When you can't go somewhere else, they're there to go for the money. They're not there for the, the people. You know what I mean? And you gotta go down and down step until everything goes smooth. And don't tell me all the, the nurses and all, all the doctors came here, they were all bad. I don't believe in that. There's some good one in there, okay? So if there's something wrong up there, that's gonna be fixed. Thank you. Thank you. What do we do from here? What can we do? We don't have any more doctors. We don't even have any more tech. I was supposed to go for a car echo. Nobody was there to give it to me. I mean, it's a change. You know, can I sit on the wheel? Sure. You know, uh, like Dave's grandfather, my father, they spent money way back. And my father was raised over 14 hours on the table. Hard time. My father gave almost $10,000 to have the hospital here. And now we don't have a word to say. They're running that. Like uh, my, all my family, the Karen, everybody. The Karen, the now we don't have nothing to say. They just they want to run the racket. I'm not for that. Um, John Lebrie. There's John Lebrie. I'm in the church in a while, can I do it? My name is uh, John McGree, and uh, I've been living in the Fort Kent for 40 years. I uh, was born and raised uh, in the town just 10 miles out of Fort Kent. Um, and I worked at the hospital for over 35 years, so I didn't know what things were like over there. Um, good and bad, so there's been a lot of good things that come out of that hospital. Um, presently, I'm the director of the ambulance service here right now. Uh, we do uh, just under a thousand runs a year, which for a 
area of this size that considered we have a fairly significant senior citizen population and that's growing um, and generally if something happens uh, response time we try to get there as fast as we can because we know that the geriatric population uh, is very fragile and things can go bad pretty quickly. Uh, my concern in reference to the American body closing is, is that OB is a very specialized um, area in the hospital setting. <coughs> the staff that work on the ambulance do have some training in childbirth and delivery, but it, it's for normal deliveries, uncomplicated deliveries, right? And it's minimal amount of training. Now, if you look at the nurses that work with me, and I know a number of them, uh, very specialized nursing care that's being provided. It's not every nurse that can do OB, and because of that, you need specialized training. But you need someone in your facility to be able to carry out that training to maintain the level of training uh, and for the uh, staff so they can provide it to the, uh, the patients that they serve. My big concern about being on uh, um, the ambulance service and if OB is closed, if we have to transport someone who is pregnant or on imminent delivery, um, we're talking the closest hospital would be 43 miles away. And 43 miles you know, from here to there is if we're taken off from the hospital. If we get a call in St. Francis or Allegheny, where uh, a woman uh, you know, ruptured her water and, and she's uh, and panicking, uh, she's on the verge of delivery, then we've got to go 30 miles that way to pick them up, and then almost 80 miles to the hospital to go to see. And that really um, bothers me because one of the things that we really need to think about is patient safety at all times. And the longer the distance, that safety factor is reduced tremendously. And so we really need to think about how we're going to proceed with this. Now, we do have staff, but we're like every other ambulance service in the state and in the nation. We're short staff. And a lot of times it's very difficult to even find staff to be on call for that day. Uh, we've been fairly lucky because we do have a great dedicated staff who even on their days off have been called and they shall be right there. But those days are coming to an end because less and less people are getting trained to do the emergency medicine pre-hospital. And if we're having issues here, other areas are having issues, but I can tell you that we've been able to maintain where other services have not. Just in the state of Maine, this year, three services have closed their doors. Part of it is because of lack of staff. Part of it is because of reimbursement. Okay. So those are two big issues that the services have to be good. My big concern, like I said, is the safety factor. Uh, we, and then the distance. Uh, we may be asked to bring somebody into Caribou uh, for delivery, but if we're short staff that day, the staff that are rolling on that delivery uh, to bring the patient to Caribou, we may not have big coverage in this area if somebody needs assistance. So we really need to try to keep this OB department open. Yes. Thank you. All right, I got both ends of this. I've had three beautiful children born at this hospital. None of them would have made the ride to care. They would, we would have been on the side of 161 and you would have had, you would have got some kid moves. Uh, at the same time, uh, I would like to also point out that six weeks ago, ish, plus or minus, we had a council meeting where the hospital uh, staff came here to answer questions and there was no other people here other than council. So I appreciate you being here and I appreciate this uh, information uh, session. It is 
important. Uh, and I believe the hospital staff here will address the issues uh, in the manner that they need to. Uh, but uh, that's really all I have to say. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to take a little tiny dig of the town council. You should put as much PR out when we have a deal. Yeah. <laughs> So the second and fourth Mondays of every month, the town council has meetings, and our agenda is posted on the town board page and at six other places in town. Uh, make yourself aware. Uh, Jake, they're at four o'clock. Four o'clock. Right. Yep. right. 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 Yeah. So again, they were at seven, and no one was showing up there, so we did it earlier because the department had to get out at four. All right. So, so that's it. I, I Next meeting. Next <laughs> meeting. Um, Okay, I've got um, a name here I can't read. It looks like Thomas from Madawaska. Yeah. Oh, hey. This Thomas. <laughs> Is that all right? It's yeah. all your own. Oh, well, like, oh, oh. There you go. Thank you, Tony. You're welcome. Oh. My name's Thomas Kent. Thomas Kent. I came to the Valley in 1962. I served 23 years on the board of the hospital. When a page was elected, he paid the hospital bills of $12 million and paid off the bills. We were in the black, and when I left the board, we were in the black. The other thing I want to say is this. Manawaska had a hospital district established by the legislature. And when the People's Benevolent Hospital, which became Northern Maine Medical Center, did their first expansion, which is now the main entrance, Madawaska gave up their Hill Burton funds to Fort Kent to build that addition and replaced in, in and received three members on the Board of Trustees as a result. Madawaska is concerned. I'm sick and tired of the revolving door to the doctors. I just get comfortable with one and they leave. I'm 83 years old and we need that hospital for the entire valley. I think it's Jim Daigle from Madawaska. Yes, sir. Hey, I'm Jim Daigle from Madawaska. I don't need a mic, that's okay. We <laughs> have a real hard time to understand how a hospital can be financially broke when they were in pretty good shape 10 years ago. Yes. Or were they not? Something something went wrong in 10 short, 8, 10 years. Anybody answer that? Okay. Um, we got Katie Lavasser. Katie, where are you? You're good. Everybody's got some good words. Uh, Charlie, what? Hey, Charlie. Yeah. So I've been running a, a, a pharmacy in town here for uh, 20 years. All of my the great majority of my business comes from the hospital, like prescribers, and so and I've got 20 employees, that, the families that depend on the hospital. <coughs> Having said that, I truly believe, as somebody who runs a business and having to make incredibly hard decisions every day about <coughs> who's good for the business, who is not good for the business. Is this insurance? Do I take this insurance? Do I not take this insurance? I, I, you know, this year I had to basically not take Tricare because I lose 20% on everything I take. And these are the things that the that the hospital has to face with every day. These are financial decisions that are going to impact the viability of the hospital. Now, I I think that this current. Uh, administration as was hired by the board to turn things around I think now 
financial now I know I know a lot of things that are being done are not popular and rarely is having to cut any kind of services popular I'm not I'm not saying any of this is a good idea and I understand that but I think what we need to do here is actually address board members directly and ask them what is the goal what what is the goal of the future you know because and forgive me if I misunderstood you, but you said we should have members of the public speak to the board. I think every single member of the board is a member of the public. And I don't think they're paid, are they? What's that? They're not paid members. No, paid. No, no, okay. Okay. Free lunch once a month. Right, what's that? Free lunch once a month. Free lunch once a month. So all of these board members are members of the public. Okay. Right? So I think we, I don't think it's, I think it's a little ingenuous to basically say, save an MMC from what the board is doing, what the hospital is doing. I think they're trying to do that. Now we need to, we need to address them. Um, and that's what the purpose of tonight is. We want a meeting with them. All we want them, them to prepare all of them. We want them to prepare the finances and show them to us and share them with the public. This is not the place for them for people to take pop shots. It's not what we keep presenting what we had, Charlie. Yeah. And that's all we had. Because nothing has been shared with us. The press conference. But did anyone who, no, who was asked to go to the press conference? Raise your hand. Wait, you were supposed to be respectful. No, no, no. I'd say who was asked to go to the press conference? She's right. Lower the whole high. Okay. Who was asked to go to the press conference here? Please raise your hand. Anybody? You guys go to the press conference? I wish. <laughs> it's not fair, Charlie, to come to us and say we have to open our door at a moment's notice. Yeah. If the door has never been opened for us, that's all I'm saying. Right. And, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm a little irritated because it's not fair. The community wants to know. The community's very concerned, Charlie. Come on here and call us out and say, is this fair? No, we're hearing stuff about the stuff in the newspaper. I didn't say we I think that. I, I think you think it was disingenuous. You, you said it was disingenuous, yeah. Charlie. And it's not because we're willing to have a conversation at another time. That's what we're asking for. We're not asking to not ever hear from them. We're just asking for a conversation, Charlie. That's all. Yeah. And I don't think that's a big ask. No. In fact, one of the things we're asking people to do, we have a petition here. We're asking people to sign with their names, their towns, and we, we, we made our request. It was all on the day we talked about it. We're asking people to sign and show the board that that's what they want. We want what's on that list. I'm just asking this, this group, is that okay? Yes. yes. Are you willing to sign the, 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 the petition? Yes. 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 Let's sign the petition and have an honest discussion. This was just an information presentation. Let's have a real discussion. I think the people in the town are willing to do whatever it takes to make this hospital work. Yes. Yes. And we're very concerned. We want to work with you. We will help however we can. The community is coming to you and asking if we can serve. Because we want this hospital more than anything. We want it to serve our smallest and our oldest with basic care. That's all we want. So please reach out to us. Reach out to the community members and we will meet with you halfway and we'll have the discussion. If the thing is pooch, if you show me the numbers and we run it by somebody and they're like, there's nothing that can be done, it's absolutely terrible, then we have a community discussion again. And we reevaluate where we are. All we're asking is for the community to be brought in the loop and there'd be no more surprises. And we're asking for things to just slow down until the community can catch, community can catch up. That's all. So I'm just going to leave it at this. I think, yes. Oh, hey, Christine. Hi. Nice Christine was going to speak earlier. She's here now. She was on the agenda, but I couldn't see her. Hello. You guys hear me okay? I'm a mom of three teenage boys, so I know how to yell or speak louder if I need to. Um, I'm super nervous right now. This is not my, my thing, so just bear with me. I was really reluctant to come speak today because I am afraid of the retaliation I might get. Okay. I was afraid of the retaliation I might get. But when I had to listen every day of the things going on to the people I love, my friends, my coworkers at our hospital, 
our hospital, I had this drive, this, I had to talk today. So here I am, all right? So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Christine Desjardins. I've been a nurse for almost 23 years. I've been employed at Northern Maine Medical Center for 18 years, 16 of those in the OB department. Now, as you all know, our OB unit is closing in two days. Um, so I'm here to speak on behalf of some of the staff, and I just want to share with you some of the observation and experiences I had over the past year while working in the OB department under the current administration. And I do understand, I fully understand, how COVID affected everybody, hospitals were hit hard, it hit us financially, it, it definitely hit us when it came to the nursing staff. I get that. But with that being said, I am standing here right now to wholeheartedly tell you the new CEO had every intention of closing RB, ROB from the very beginning. That's right. Okay, ROB did not did not stand a chance under this current administration. A year ago, this time, I was the OB manager and had been there for a couple years. We were experiencing staffing issues as all the departments were. Staffing was tight everywhere. I had a couple of nurses who told me they were planning on moving in the, in, within a year and some had even cut down hours because they wanted to spend time with their families and be home. So staffing was tight, but we made it work. We are the little team that could. I'm very proud of them. But we knew we had to focus on hiring and training for the upcoming departures. And as you all know, you cannot train a nurse to be an OB nurse overnight. Training can take months, and some, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes up to a year, depending on how much experience that nurse has. Come June or July, again, I don't know specific dates and times, um, but there were many rumors floating around our hospital and our community that our OB unit was closing. The OB staff, including myself, we never got a clear answer. There was no communication. These rumors and lack of communication caused a lot of stress and anxiety for all of us. My OB nurses were worried about their jobs and about our unit. And let me be clear, OB nurses want to work in OB units. So the possibility of our OB closing, I'm sure, expedited some of the staff's decisions to leave and find work elsewhere. In early July, the, administration, the administrative team sent out a mass email to all the nurses in the organization asking if anyone would be interested in training labor and delivery, postpartum, newborn care. Now, I'm not specifically sure about the number, but I want to say it was somewhere close to maybe 10 nurses that responded that were interested. The administrative team did narrow it down, which is perfectly fine, and came out with about maybe four or five candidates that they thought might have been a good fit. But it never went any further than that. As an OB manager, I never spoke to any of these people. Nobody was ever trained. It always seemed like there was an excuse as to why things didn't happen. Also at this time, the administration put together an OB strategic subcommittee to discuss the future of OB. We had no idea what was being discussed at these meetings. The OB staff were never invited. As an OB manager, I was not invited. You'd think if your OB unit is in dire straits, you'd invite the staff. So, you know, maybe we had some suggestions. I, I don't know. So during the summer months, myself and a couple of my nursing colleagues had interviewed many OB travelers, you know, for temporary positions. Some of them were not good, okay? But there were a few that were. And every time we would recommend a traveler for our unit, the, administrator, the administrators would say no. Or they'd sit on it long enough where that traveler would go find work elsewhere. In July, I had the pleasure of interviewing a nurse with 35 plus years of OB and ICU experience. She applied for a per diem day shift position. She was willing to work a few shifts every other week. She was even willing to work ICU. And I know ICU could use the help at the time. She came up with a lot of nursing experience and we felt she would have been a great fit. But again, the administration said no. There were many OB positions posted with huge sign-on bonuses. But you have to remember, 
it's going to be hard to attract Wilby nurses to apply for a position when there, there are rumors going around that your unit will be closing. By early August, our education department started training the ER nurses and providers to deliver babies in the ER. At some point during this time, the administration team did come around and start meeting with the OB nurses to discuss staffing. I personally feel they told us what we wanted to hear. Promises of trying their best to recruit and train. But I suppose their efforts have to look good on paper. But let me reassure you, no action was ever taken. One of our own night shift nurses who works med surge full time applied for a full time OB night shift position. Her hire date was October 21, 2022. She got the job and we were excited. But not once did she ever make it to OB to train. I understand that staffing was, was slim and tight on the other units, but there was no sense of urgency to get her over to train. They never gave her that opportunity. Excuse me, my mouth is dry. And of course, there's always the discussion about the numbers of deliveries we had each year. It's true, the numbers had decreased. They were not like what they used to be when I started there in 2004. But you have to remember, we had hired Dr. Clark a couple years ago. We had hired Dr. Welch last summer. It takes time for providers to grow a patient list. And correct me if I'm wrong, but growing a baby takes about nine months. <laughs> And then there was the diversion plan in the spring. Staffing was so tight on the OB unit, we simply did not have enough people. So the plan was, when there was not a staff, whether they were out sick or there were technical issues, we had to close the OB unit and divert our patients to carry, which meant if someone came into labor or for any reason, they were triaged in the emergency room and then transferred to carry. Okay. And I get it, I, some days there were no OB nurses to take care of them and this had to happen. But there were multiple occasions where there was an OB nurse for that day shift or that night shift. And we wanted to triage our OB patient on our OB unit. The unit that we were familiar with, that we had all the appropriate equipment to take care of them, all the appropriate medications that we had readily available. But they said no. They fought us at every turn. This was so frustrating for all of the OB staff, the OB providers, and I'm sure the ER staff as well. It was frustrating and it was not safe. But it was a fight the whole time. Now, amongst other things, closing our OB unit, as we all know, we've lost our residency program. Our student nurses will not have to travel to go do their clinical summers else. And let's not forget the most important issue here. The closing of our OB unit will have a profound effect on the safety and well-being of our pregnant population and their families. I'm standing here right now to tell you guys that I love our hospital and I especially love my OB unit. I love my OB team. I tried my very best to make it work. I tried to stay as long as I could. But there came a point where I had to go for my own well-being. The work environment became very toxic and dysfunctional. I left because I lost faith and trust in my administrators. I left because my unit was being neglected by our administrators and I witnessed our OB providers being systematically picked apart. Just think about, think about it, in one year, just one year, our OB unit has closed and we've lost four fantastic providers. <laughs> family practice, OB providers, providers that wanted to stay here and loved, wanted to be here and loved what they did. So just think about what this means for you, all of you and your families and your community. And I know you guys have all noticed that not too many staff are coming forward to tell you how they're feeling right now and the turmoil they're experiencing. They're scared. Nobody's speaking up because the environment has become hostile and their fear of retaliation. If you speak up and you challenge, you have the risk of losing your job. 
So I ask you all to take a moment and think of everyone you know who is employed at the hospital currently and former. These are your friends, your family, and your neighbors. They have devoted their time, energy, and love into that hospital. What's happened in, over the past year has had a devastating effect on all of us. Think of those people who have been removed, demoted, and simply left because they felt the same way I did. I hope by talking that I have given a better understanding of some of the things that took place over the past year. Our OB unit has always been the heart of this community. And I also hope that I can give courage to others to speak up. Thank you for listening to me. Okay, I know, it's going, I know it's getting late, people are tired, but um, I fought with my technology and presented some data, but I did tell my story. And um, I'm not going to exactly do that, but there's something that I think needs to be said. Uh, we have kids in the school system, we have one in middle school, we have one almost in high school, and it seems like every few weeks they come home and they say, hey, we have a new person in our class. And they're both saying it. And it seems like there's more and more families with kids either returning to this community or moving to this community. Um, Toby and I moved back when our oldest was four months old because Portland was a lot of fun, but this was where we wanted to raise our kids. And I think all of us who choose to stay in this community, we kind of have a pro and con list, right? There are great things elsewhere and there are great things here. And for now, the great things here outweigh the things elsewhere. I would love to go somewhere that had Thai food, I'm sorry, not Thai food, Japanese food, Indian food. Um, I would love to go somewhere that had a library system that was open seven days a week. There's so, I would love to go to a place that had an indoor swimming pool. But what we have here is still better than that. But. I know that all of us, when we make that list, that pro and con list, if you take the hospital out of there, if you take the hospital that serves families off of that list, that changes the math. That changes what draws people here. That changes what keeps people here. And it's really easy to forget that because it's always been here and it's easy to feel like it's always going to be here. But it's changing and it's changing really fast. We don't know what that's going to mean for us. We don't know what that's going to mean for our population, but you can darn well be sure it's going to have an impact on our own economy. We need to think about that. We might consider that an externality when we're crunching the numbers, but it's real. And we need to keep that in mind. That's true. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wasn't planning on speaking tonight. <laughs> And I don't know if I can follow Christine's presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, my name's George Conover. I'm a uh, family physician. I will be at Northern Maine Medical Center for 30 years. Two years. Okay, Eric. Yeah. Thought my voice was loud enough. <laughs> for 30 years, delivered 2,000 babies. I came here in 1985. The year before I got here, the, there was no OB unit. They had closed for lack of delivering physicians and people were traveling to Caribou and Prescott. Luckily, there weren't any major emergencies, but there were some people that came into the hospital during that year that uh, essentially couldn't make it to Caribou or to Prescott. And they were taken care of the best they could by the people who were available. One of the things that attracted me to this community was the idea of reopening the OB unit and practicing in a community where the emphasis was on primary care. For, that may be a jargon word to some of you, but primary care is the first doctor that you see. The one that is trained in all the systems of your body take, can take care of a good number of those things, him or herself, and then can refer for more specialized care to somewhere else. That's, in my opinion, what a community hospital in a community the size of Fort Kent should provide. Primary care, OB, basic pediatrics, the things that you start with, not hip replacements and knee replacements. Those are good things to do, 
They get great reimbursement from insurance companies, but you can go somewhere else for that. It's, we don't need to maintain those kind of services in a hospital like we have. What I think as a community we need to do is we need to contact the board and tell them what our vision of this hospital is, what our mission statement is. We need primary care. We need OB. We can't, we can't have a hospital where there aren't people trained in doing an emergency delivery. I had my share of those. A delivery can turn from routine to emergency in two seconds. And you have to know what you're doing. You need a staff that is trained in that. You need a, a physician or a midwife. You need a nursing staff. And that needs to be maintained. Now, it can be maintained. OB has never been a money maker for the hospital. I'm well aware of that. And with the number of deliveries we have based on the size of our community, it has always been a struggle. It's been a struggle for years. And there's been talk about cutting back on OB or eliminating OB for most of the 30 years that I was in practice, even though we did have a lot more deliveries during that time. Uh, and I think that's the message we need to give. What is the hospital going to focus on? Is it going to be on specialty services because they reimburse more? That may help the bottom line, but is that really what we need in a community our size? as our community hospital? Or do we need to tell our board, we need primary care, we need OD, we need basic pediatrics, we need a place to stabilize people, and if they need to be sent on to somewhere else, they can be taken care of and stabilized prior to the transfer. So. Thank you. The uh, sign-up sheet is in the hallway outside. Uh, if you want to sign the petition that, that asked to, to have to be presented here. Sorry, I've talked all night at Grand Awards. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, the board, for coming. And thank you, the uh, administration, for coming. Take the lawn signs. Oh, and there's some lawn signs outside. We have lawn signs in the lobby if you'd like to put one out.